Let's get started. It's top of the hour, Thursday, May 11th. And I'm here to talk to you today about this amazing program we have called Moonshots and Moneymakers, the Oxford Innovation Conference for Business Leaders. And if you don't mind, I'll just take a little time to sort of unpack what that means. Uh, the Oxford Innovation Conference for Business Leaders takes place at Oxford University in the United Kingdom, the town of Oxford, famous obviously for Oxford University. And for those of you who are British TV buffs, famous for a lot of shows that take place in Oxford, a lot of detective shows. There seems to be a ser serial killer alive and running around in Oxford every week if you believe what you watch on the BBC uh, British detective shows. Um, in fact, it's just a gorgeous town. Uh, when we go in August, the weather is perfect. Um, and the thing to know about Oxford, for those of you who haven't been there, is, gosh, it is 1,000 years old as a town. Um, the university is about 800 years old. The story about how Oxford University originated is a wonderful story, a dramatic one. It's about differences, religious differences between people leading to splits in the church, leading to different groups being formed. The, the, um, the story of Cambridge forming out of a group of people at Oxford, a group of clerics who were insulted in Oxford and then they wandered off into a little town called Cambridge, thereby setting off a multi-century rivalry between Oxford and Cambridge. So you are talking about a town, it is a medieval town, in fact, with, as you can imagine, the medieval walls around it. You are talking about a town where discussion and thought and exploration and innovation has been taking place for hundreds and hundreds of years, nearly a thousand years. For those of us that are Americans, it's a little hard to relate or compare it to anything here in America. The closest comparison would be Princeton University, which is 1700. Uh, the century, the 18th century when it got started and is in fact modeled on Oxford and by coincidence is where we hold Birthing of Giants Fellowship program uh, when we hold that program. But Oxford University is a beautiful, glorious place. The Oxford Botanical Gardens are glorious. We have been chosen by a school called St. Edmunds, sometimes called Teddy's. St. Edmunds is the oldest learning institution in Oxford University. And when we meet there in August 7th to 10th, um, we stay and eat in the dorms and the dining area of the oldest school in Oxford. Now, Oxford is actually made up of 39 colleges. So it's Oxford University System and St. Edmunds is one of those colleges. Um, there are some very famous colleges, um, ones that princes will attend and uh, kings and queens will attend and, um, uh, prime ministers will attend. And St. Edmunds is uh, not quite there yet. There's a rumor that a prime minister or two down the road is likely to come from St. Edmunds. I'm not sure I understand uh, British politics enough to know how that'll come out. But the, um, there, are, there are very famous schools at Oxford, like Christ Church and Maudlin. And then the St. Edmunds is just a wonderful, again, the oldest, the oldest um, school. Imagine a beautiful courtyard uh, in fact, I'll show you a picture of one in a little bit. And that's where we do our learning. So what happens in, during these five, four days? Well, first, let me just explain what Moonshots and Moneymakers is and how it came about. The innovators that go through our school called Birthing of Giants Fellowship Program are individuals who run companies with revenues north of uh, $5 million. So they're companies that do well. Um, they're typically started from scratch. They don't have VC money. They don't have private equity money. And the companies will go from 5 million to hundreds of millions of dollars. Some are close to a billion at this point. Um, and their headcounts will be anywhere from 10 to several thousand. But I would say the sweet spot is something like 25 to $50 million in revenue and about 50 to 200 people. And that's the Birthing of Giants Fellowship Program, which takes place at Princeton. And we were running this program with them for years when we started to see this phenomenon. And the phenomenon was these companies, call it a $25 million company with 50 people, were starting to innovate in a way where when others, like particularly the capital markets, the private equity guys, the banks, the corporate M&A people looked at their companies, they saw them completely differently. 
So the introduction of technology into those companies was changing the way they were viewed by the outside world. And we started to chart this transition from what we ended up calling a moneymaker, company that makes money, to a moonshot. And we were noticing that it was happening faster and faster. And what we learned is that if you have a very good moneymaker business, again, $25 million with, you know, uh, let's just say you have a 10% um, EBITDA, that's two and a half million dollars. You know, everything's good. Things are good. But then as you're starting to figure out what's next, these folks were discovering that by introducing technology, what we ended up calling enabling technology in a thoughtful way, all of a sudden that company that might've been worth $25 million with the right technology, the right plan, the right strategy, and having the right impact on their economics could be worth a hundred million or a billion dollars. And that happened in our community. So we described this transition as going from moneymaker to moonshot. And then we started to dive deeper and deeper into how do we discover the innovations that will enable our companies to grow. A lot of us run similar types of companies. We might run B2B companies, we might run services companies. We are not Silicon Valley companies. We're not the kind of people who say, I'm raising $3 million to try out an idea. We are companies that make money. And so these companies are what they call matrix, meaning you probably have a CEO, then you might have a, a C-suite, and underneath that you might have a leadership team, a management team, and uh, you've got you know different divisions. And those leaders, whether they were the CEO, the CTO, the VP of operations, the VP of finance, the VP of technology, were increasingly involved in this conversation, which is how do we incorporate technology thoughtfully? How do we discover technology that enables our business that we can sell to our clients and build a much bigger client base? That would transform the value of our companies from being valued like a moneymaker, a traditionally valued company, into a company that would be valued like a moonshot, a company where the growth curve is so significant that it's very difficult to figure out what the company should be worth. Uh, so I often tell this story, and there's a video on our site about it, but imagine that you ran a, a corporate catering business that did $5 million a year. And you think about what that corporate catering business is good at. Well. It's good at getting food out on time. It's good at running a safe and safety inspected uh, kitchen that can produce different kinds of cuisines and get them to different locations when they are needed. Now imagine that business doing a $5 million in revenue and somebody wants to buy it. Let's just say, I'll, I won't go through all the math, but let's just say it's worth three, four, five million dollars to a buyer. Now, for those of you who haven't heard of what a ghost kitchen is, that's where you take a traditional kitchen, like a corporate kitchen, only we call them a commissary at this point, and you layer on all this technology that you're all very familiar with, Uber Eats, Grubhub, Seamless, DoorDash. And instead of that um, corporate catering business being known as the ABC Catering Company, it now has, it appears in the food apps as 10 different restaurants, a burger restaurant, a Chinese restaurant, a Mexican restaurant, an Italian restaurant, so on. And the orders come in, the food is prepared, and it is sent out to its destination. The difference between those two businesses, even though they're doing the exact same thing, is that difference of technology that enables a very different business. And when the outside people come looking at that business, they would not value that at three, four, five million dollars. They'd probably value that same business, even if it got up to five million in revenue, at something like 30, 40, or 50 million dollars, because it's got a growth curve that's hard to track because that the opportunity to grow that business is so significant. So what's important about that story is that the difference in how those two companies run is not that great. One has, let's say, 20 or 30 corporate clients that salespeople are going out and getting, and they produce food on time, on schedule, on budget. And the other has hundreds or thousands of clients, and the food orders are coming in through apps, and they're producing food on time, on schedule, on budget. It's just that the valuation of those two businesses is extremely different. That's the difference between a moneymaker, the corporate catering business, and a moonshot, the ghost kitchen. If that sounds like a fun or even silly example, I can share with you that Travis Kalnick, who is the founder of Uber, left Uber and started ghost kitchens. And that company is now worth billions and billions of dollars. He basically built a series of commissary kitchens around the country. So, if you're a corporate caterer at home, you might be thinking, you know, this is a way for me to grow my business to another level. Well, let's say you're just 
a different type of business to business altogether. Maybe you're in information systems, IT. Maybe you're in communications and marketing. Maybe you're in the defense industry. Maybe you're in real estate, construction, property. Maybe you're in heavy equipment. And you say, well, what does that corporate catering example have to do with me? That's what Moonshots and Moneymakers is all about. So imagine going to Oxford University where a thousand years of thinking has taken place and joining up with a group of other business leaders who want to create or find the technology that enables their business to go from moneymaker to moonshot. And how does that work? What are the best practices? What are the case studies? Show me how the economics work. Show me the difference between making a good decision around technology and a bad decision around technology. That's what we do while we're there. But here's where it gets really exciting. When While we're learning <clears throat> the sort of fundamental infrastructure in terms of turning a moneymaker into a moonshot, we also do something that is incredibly fun. We basically learn about what's called the innovation ecosystem. Now, you're all familiar with Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is one example of an innovation ecosystem. Short version, somebody's got a great idea, they go to somebody with money, so there's the idea people on one side, and they're also the operators, and then they've got the money people on another side, and the money finds its way to the idea people, and they come up with a new way to do something, and they build that company. That's the Silicon Valley model. The academic model is where really smart people, these are going to be PhDs, PhD candidates, graduate students, professors, um, essentially follow pure innovation. In other words, they're really kind of left out of the the sort of commercial market that, that Silicon Valley is all about. And they say, just come up with something that's different, that's innovative, that moves the needle, that advances the cause. This could be in life sciences, chemistry, robotics, hardware, software, artificial intelligence, all of those things that you're very aware of in terms of innovations have come, frequently have come out of a academic innovation environment, which is described as pure innovation without the market particularly influencing it. Here's what happens at Oxford. <clears throat> at Oxford, they have about a $1 billion R&D budget. That means that these kinds of experiments are taking place all over Oxford, sometimes for 20 years. People trying to advance things like the in, in the town of Oxford and in the university system, you've seen um, they've learned how to control atomic energy. This is dating back 70 years. They learned about things, how to create things like antibiotics, they invented the microscope. We're talking about innovations that have changed the world. So what we do when we go there, for the months before we get there, we have a team on the ground at Oxford that scours the Oxford innovation community, ultimately pulling together what we think are the 12 best innovations coming out of the Oxford innovation community, that $1 billion R&D community, where their technologies have the potential to enable money makers turning into moonshots. So in addition to spending a couple few days learning about how money makers become moonshots and all the case studies and examples, we actually get to meet the innovators and they pitch to us what they're working on in their laboratories that represents pure innovation, but has in our eyes through a committee we set up the potential to enable your businesses to translate from moneymaker to moonshot. Again, we're talking about hardware, software, AI, machine learning, big data, chemistry, life sciences, power, energy management. Um, it's quite an incredible opportunity. And so for about a day and a half while we're in Oxford, we get 12 presentations at the site of what's called the Harwell Science Center, which is a place where Things like quantum computing were created, things like uh, the COVID vaccine was created, um, and just some of the most amazing innovations of the world. And so here's the invitation. I'm actually going to wrap up soon, and I'm going to invite some of the folks who went in the, few, in the past to talk about their experience. But here's the opportunity. I want all of you to think about the following. What would it be like? whether you're a VP of tech or you're the CEO of your company, or you, can have, or you have an entire team that you're responsible for, what would it be like to spend four days in a place where some of the most amazing innovation has come, 
some of the most creative thought has come in the history of the world. Where the, and I'm happy to report in August, usually the sun is shining, the flowers are blooming, <laughs> the grass is growing. And for you to spend a week with other people who want to turn their money makers into moonshots, who want to scale up their companies considerably through the thoughtful introduction of enabling technology, looking at how this is done, looking at success stories, meeting the business owners who have built their companies from money makers to moonshots, and then discovering the dozen most significant innovations coming out of the Oxford innovation community, this billion dollar ecosystem of innovation, of pure innovation, to see if there's something there that will inspire you, something there that will trigger a big idea inside of you, or someone there who's got a company or a technology that you wanna do business with. Maybe you wanna license it. Maybe you wanna represent it in the United States. Maybe you want to buy it. Maybe you want to invest in it. Maybe you want to advise it. There's all sorts of deals that can be done with these folks. So that's the beauty of the Moonshots and Moneymakers community is it really represents a bunch of really smart business leaders um, coming to the UK Oxford Innovation Ecosystem and essentially discovering people and ideas that have the potential to change absolutely everything. And so what I wanna do now is I'm gonna share my screen to just give you a sense of some of the pictures. Let's see how I do this. Share screen. And let's see how I do here. Share my desktop. Tell me if you guys see, I hope you see my slides. And I just wanna give you some of the sense of the visuals of our experience. It is beautiful, those folks on the left that's Sir Stephen Wilkinson, uh, and that is Doug Tatum, one of the one of the leading private equity guys in America. You've got uh, Van Sullivan off to the right, Norm Brodsky, for those of you who know him from Inc. Magazine, he comes every year, I'll share a bit about his role there, and that's his lovely wife Elaine next to him, and also Doug Tatum. You've got all the way off to the way right, the beautiful libraries, the librarian of St. Edmunds, our host, he hosted us in their library where we saw books that were hundreds and hundreds of years old. He put them all out. You can see that I'm on the table uh, in that picture. And then that lower picture is us uh, at the beginning of a dining experience. The dining ritual at Oxford is not to be missed and not to be trifled with. The history of the dining experience is the following. You sit wherever the next empty seat is. You don't sit with your friend. You don't sit with your companion. You sit wherever the next empty seat is and then someone sits next to you. And pretty much the Oxford tradition would be at each meal, which is lunch and dinner typically, you look at the person to your left, right, or across from you, and you say this, what are you working on? That's what you say, what are you working on? And the point of that in the Oxford experience is to create cross-collateralized idea generation. Because St. Edmunds is not a business school, it's not a liberal arts school. Every school has every subject not every subject, they specialize in what they specialize in, but they're mostly based on who the advisors of that school are. So you could easily have a chemistry professor next to a uh, humanities student, next to a you know, uh, geology student, everyone's in the same school. And the point of that eating tradition, that dining tradition at Oxford is you look across the table, you say, what are you working on? And for literally for 800 years now, the good things that have come out of those conversation is every single success story out of Oxford, people collaborating and sharing ideas. So that bottom picture is us all getting ready. We're listening to a speaker right now. And when he's done, we will just join each other. These are the folks that attended and we will get to know each other. What are you working on? That's where the collaboration takes place. Here's just some more pictures of us. They're on set to me off in the upper left with the sunglasses with two of our folks. Um, that's a very famous bridge in Oxford. That's, you know, I don't know, maybe five minutes from where we, from St. Edmunds. The Eagle and Child is, has a very famous reference. I'll let you figure that out for yourself, uh, but it has a very famous reference in Oxford. And I wanna share with you these two young people that are speaking at the podium below. Uh, we invite 20 students from a school called Ryder University. And Norm Brodsky is one of the uh, biggest alumni supporters of Ryder University. It's almost a 200 year old school, which in American terms is obviously pretty old, not in Oxford terms, but in American terms. And 
those two young people that you see speaking are part of the 20 we take with us. So here's how it happens. First of all, Ryder University is what's called an FLI school. F stands for first in the family to go to college. LI stands for low income, Let FLI. And so these 20 students are brought to Oxford University. They're all typically first in their family to go to college. The stories that got them to college are dramatic. And we expose them to the Oxford environment like nothing they've ever seen before. And we pay for it all. So part of the way this works is our tuition goes towards bringing these 20 young people, these 20 young undergraduate students from Ryder University, this first in the family low income school. And they're really just a lot of fun. They bring tremendous energy and it's just a thrill to have them there with us. And so here what you have is the courtyard of St. Edmunds. I mean, there's a reason why we call it Hogwarts for entrepreneurs. This is really ripped right out of Harry Potter. And in fact, Harry Potter scenes are shot throughout Oxford. And this is just the collective group who went last year, including the students. And it's quite a wonderful community of people. They help each other. They're there to support each other. And it just makes for a very wonderful experience over four days in a beautiful place, Oxford. So with that, what I'd like to do is <coughs> invite you. Well, first, let me tell you some of the details of the, of the program itself. It takes place from August 7th, which is a Monday, to August 10th, which is a Thursday. We have a bonus program on August 11th for people who are interested in innovations coming out of the government sector. Um, but we also encourage people to stay through August 11th Friday because we want them to stay for one solid day walking around Oxford, processing all the tremendous ideas that have passed through their head and just enjoying the grounds on that Friday. So formal program is from August 7th, Monday to August 10th, Thursday. Strong recommend recommendation to stay one more day on Friday and enjoy the experience. So that means logistically speaking, <laughs> you're gonna be arriving probably on Sunday, August 6th. Uh, the two airports that serve Oxford, one is called Gatwick Airport and the other is the very famous Heathrow Airport. They're both ba basically equidistant. You can take a car from the airport to Oxford, but you can, the UK has wonderful public transportation. So you can take a train or a bus from the airport to uh, Oxford. And while we're there, you can stay in the dorms of St. Edmunds. Obviously, those are inexpensive. Um, we do have rooms in the dorms available for people where we actually have their own bathroom. Each person has their own bathroom. It's kind of a kind of an extraordinary thing if you think about it being a 700-year-old university where some of the dorm buildings don't even have bathrooms in them. <laughs> but uh, we have dorm rooms where the bathrooms are actually in the dorm rooms. Um, or if you're more comfortable, you could stay at a Marriott hotel down the street, or you could stay at some beautiful uh, local hotels, which we identify for you. Obviously, price is commensurate with, with the quality. So you can stay with all of us. The whole faculty stays in the dorms because it's a lot of fun, and those rider students stay with us in the dorms. Or you can stay in a hotel. The price uh, is uh, 4,995 British pounds um, plus hotel, depending on what you choose and your travel. And a lot of folks do the following. They, they often bring a companion, which you can do. That companion will be invited to some of the things we do, the more social things that we do. You can um, you know, bring your family, which is common. Uh, you can bring your entire team or, or, or some members of your team that you wanna reward with this experience. It's a great experience for that member of your team who thinks, you know, I have a lot of ideas. I need to figure out how to marshal these ideas into something productive. And we basically show them, you know, Ideas are only valuable if they can turn your moneymaker into a moonshot. We, we teach how that happens. Um, <clears throat> and the, uh, you know, it's just a very enriching experience of, of basically people who are innovative minded in an environment where a billion dollars of innovation funds are being thrown around. Um, I think that's all I really wanted to say. We're, we're, um, we still have enrollments uh, available. Uh, so you're welcome to go to moonshotsmoneymakers.com and just uh, request your invitation. And I'm gonna ask, well, Ron Steptoe is always ready for a, talk, for a conversation. So Ron, I see your hand is up. Hey, Ron, do you mind um, sh oh, turning your, yeah, there you go. And I, you may have a question, but I also want to ask you to share your experience. Yeah, Lewis, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, more just want to share my experience. Uh, it was absolutely amazing uh, opportunity to one, get outside of the country, get a chance to hear about what innovation is taking place around the world. 
and to see the connectivity that uh, Moonshots and Money Makers has made along with Birthing of Giants to Oxford University and how excited Oxford is about having us come there, as excited as we are about being there is absolutely amazing. I think one of the things I wanted to share more than anything is that uh, for those who decide to participate, you're joining a community. It's not a situation where you go, it's a fee, you go and it's over. Uh, it, 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 it's a live community that continues to grow and expand. And we basically are building our own cohort of innovators that I think in a very unique way will have international uh, connections and it's our own community. So to be a part of this program, something literally relationships that you can leave to your family members and other folks who become part of this community, it, it's a lot more than, than you think it is. And so I'll just stop there and say that it's a pleasure to be a part of community. One of the reasons I want to be a part of the uh, the ambassador program, because I do see these relationships not only transcending my business and what we're doing here, but I see these are relationships I can pass on to my kids. I couldn't agree more. In fact, uh, I almost got my 18 year old son to come run and then he, he sort of tossed me over the side for summer camp. But he will come one day. I agree with you. It was a fun experience. I didn't know Ron before we arrived. Ron and I are now friends. I've had a chance to interview him about not just his business success, but his family history. It is a very rich story. And um, he's been very helpful to the other people in the community. I think he's seen the direction and dimension for his own business in terms of where to take it, uh, which is a great business called Warrior Centric Health. Warrior Centric Health. I just have to plug it because it's such an amazing business. Um, they create a digital uh, document and digital database on the kinds of symptoms and ailments and conditions that warriors, these are uh, start off with veterans who've served the American military, suffer so that if you are a veteran going to your doctor in uh, you know Kansas City, Missouri, that doctor will have access to the history of situations, ailments, symptoms that affect veterans because they've been exposed to things that others of us haven't that eventually can expand to other communities like first responders ron is a perfect example of a money maker that has always been on his way to becoming a moonshot the company has been so thanks thanks ron thank you for that um see if i can put the squeeze on bob eiseminger if he wants to talk bob about your experience there yeah sure uh, lewis i'll just share a few thoughts and number one um <clears throat> It's always important for people to do continuous learning, and this is an event. I'm going to call it an event. Um, it's an event that is different than anything you'll ever go to. Uh, it's an event that forces you to step away from your business and sharpen the saw. You know, just like the best way to chop down a tree is to every once in a while step away from what you're doing and sharpen the saw. Uh, and then get back at it. This is the place to do it. It's a place to step away, reflect on your own business, hear from some amazing other folks from businesses that may be completely different than your own. And you may ask yourself, well, what am I ever going to learn from them? And the answer is you'd be surprised. I know I was uh, uh, years ago when I went through Birthing of Giants the first time. Uh, the amount of things I learned from folks that uh, that had nothing to do with the type of work that I did. And I was in an information technology uh, government contractor business that, that, that I ran. Um, it, it, it's worth uh, it's, it's worth the amount of money to attend, uh, but more and more importantly, your time is, is something that I know is a lot more valuable than just that uh, small fee. And it's worth your time. Um, I, I know that sounds like a, a selfish plug, but... Uh, yeah. Uh, I would recommend it to, to anybody. And, and I think folks that even went to it last year, uh, I know a few folks that may have been like a little skeptical uh, and, and they walked out just uh, just just amazed with the program. Uh, uh, I, I would say almost on a on a high and wanting to get back to their business and and take some of the, the, the lessons and conversations that they had with folks and uh, and take those and turn them into something really good. Yeah, I agree, Bob. And I'll leave, yeah. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And in fact, it was conversations with Bob and, um, and Ron and others that got us thinking about the other huge innovation ecosystem. So there's what we call Silicon Valley, which is just people with good ideas, finding people with money. Then you have the academic innovation ecosystem that's famous at places like MIT and, and Oxford and others. And then you have uh, what's called the government 
innovation ecosystem that if you have a solution, a product that can serve government, that can help government solve a problem, and if it's innovative, they, they have all these mechanisms to fund that process. And so we took our entire group after Oxford in August. We all met in February in Washington, D.C., and similarly invited the dozen best innovations coming out of the government innovation ecosystem to present to us. And again, not surprisingly, fireworks happened. So thanks to Bob Eisinger and Ron Steptoe for helping put that together. Um, and I'm going to invite anyone who has any questions to drop them into the Q&A or to the chat. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, to the Q&A or chat, and we'll answer them. Um, and Ethan, um, Ethan Dowie, do you mind unmuting yourself? Hey, what's going on, Louis? The, hey, buddy. Ethan, I, I'm sorry if I forget this because we've had a number of rider kids go through, but you were in the first rider group, right? I was, yes, the first of yes. all time. Okay, for, so Ethan is a rider university graduate. Uh, he's now out in the working world, uh, making a living like the rest of us. And um, But he went through our 2019 program. So Ethan, uh, talk a bit from a student's point of view, what it was like for you then and how it might have any impact on the work you're doing now. Yeah, well, you know, it was the first one. So we all didn't really know what to expect when we went. Like we were told originally, quote unquote, we're just going to be flies on the wall. And it couldn't have been more opposite for us. We got there and we were immediately interacting with these great entrepreneurs. And on top of just being so fun, it was just so knowledgeable because nothing went over our heads. Everything was broken down so that we could understand it as students. And for me, who I'm now running my own uh, merchandise distributorship, it's just been great because I'm taking all that knowledge that I learned and just transitioning it into the early stages of my business and really saving myself from making a ton of mistakes that I that I learned from all the entrepreneurs. So, you know, it, it was such a good experience. It was really fun. And I can't highlight enough the, the community aspect and what you just said of it being fireworks when you're putting all these great people together. That's just a perfect sum up, in my opinion. Oh, thanks, Ethan. Yeah, we had so much fun with you and your friends and your your peers. I have to say the the addition of these wonderful writer students uh, who are such great kids. I know I'm not supposed to call them kids, but great young people. Um, yeah, it actually makes it quite wonderful, the, the program as well. And then, and then to see all the Oxford students who wear their gowns, those sort of like, they look like graduation gowns, but they wear them to dinner every night. Um, it's just so fun to be in that environment. You really do feel like you're actually in a Harry Potter movie, actually. Anyone have any questions for us about the program, either logistics or just, you know, thematically what, what goes on, how it might work with your business? Happy to take them. Just drop into the Q&A and then we'll, we'll call on you and or into the chat. And in the chat window right now is the website URL, moonshotsmoneymakers.com. So um, we are still taking some people into this program and we're looking for uh, a few good men or women from the technology innovation area that want to change the world or are open to the innovation or technology that can change their companies. Okay, well, that's perfect. So we are at about uh, 2.36 Eastern time and I wanna thank everyone for coming. Oh wait, let me see, I just got a question from, from Ethan. Oh, do we know what the interactive activities would be yet like the seminars? Yeah, the program, there's actually a version of the program on our website called uh, moonshotsmoneymakers.com. But essentially, day one, it's a great question, Ethan, thank you. Day one, we really explore what is this, what is the um, environment that we're calling moonshots and moneymakers? What is the, what's driving this sort of uh, change in business fundamentally? And what are the examples of it? So we're looking deeply at what is, um, why businesses are more frequently becoming moonshots. And let me just give you that thought to, to rumble around your head for a while. You may be in a category, maybe you're in the trucking business, okay? I don't know. And you say, no, well, we do trucking. We get paid by the mile, we get paid by the ton. This is how our business runs. I promise you this, somebody in that business, a different business next to yours, a company next to yours, is going to introduce innovation in a way that you could have thought of, that anyone could have thought of because you know your business very well and you know how technology can change it. And they will do it in a way where their business goes from being worth whatever a comparable business would be worth to something that's 10 or 100 times more valuable because of it. <clears throat> I'll tell you the story of um, um, uh, D'Artagnan Meats. Uh, this is a meat wholesaler, about a $125 million meat wholesaler, and they serve restaurants. And they brought the same, let's say, 10 
choice cuts to restaurants from the cow. And, you know, it became obvious to them that there was a lot of other parts of the cow that could be served to people. It's just that they weren't popular at restaurants. So they, they basically, after having built this massive nationwide uh, meat distributor, started to build a uh, what they call a DTC business, a direct-to-consumer business. So they were packaged, instead of sending 100 pounds of meat to a restaurant, they were now putting them in little pounds of little packages of one or two pounds. And you'd go on the website and you'd buy a piece of meat. Um, now, the margins in that business were much, much better than the business where you sell, sell 100 pounds to a restaurant. And lo and behold, a private equity firm comes through and says, you know what? That little $5 million direct-to-consumer business you've built is worth as much as your $125 million meat distributor because the growth potential was so great for that business. So she was able to turn her moneymaker into a moonshot alongside her moneymaker. I tell that story because day one, we're basically exploring deep dive how this is taking place. Day two, we look at all the different innovation ecosystems, Silicon Valley, government, academic, how they work, what the opportunity is for all of us, how we can leverage those innovation ecosystems the most. And day three, we go visit the innovators at Harwell Science Center. Day four, we essentially close out with some really powerful keynotes and we network with each other and we network with the innovators. We make deals with the innovators. And day five, I think is a day of open reflection where you just hang out in Oxford, but we're also adding on a new piece, which is that you can see what the UK government innovation ecosystem is producing. So it's kind of a new thing. Uh, great question, Ethan. And I see Art has asked a question. Um, yes. Are there any follow-on activities after the conference where attendees stay connected? Yes. Great question, Art. One, we keep our Slack channel open so people all stay in touch with each other. But two, we meet six months later in Washington, D.C. So we have the first program at Oxford in August. We have the second program in Washington, D.C. in February. And... Um, so that's where we all get together. So essentially, we're getting together every six months now uh, to advance our cause. What's our cause? Seeking out enabling technology that can help turn our, in, our money makers into moonshots. So that half year program is a new thing we just started this year and it went over really, really, really well. Great question. Thanks, Art. Okay. Any other questions? All right, folks, it is 2.40 Eastern time. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, we're going to be recording this and sending the link out so you can share it with your teams. Moonshotsmoneymakers.com. Request an invitation to the conference August 7th through 10th. Um, have the experience of a lifetime in a place called Oxford. Some of you have been there. Many of us haven't. It is like stepping on another planet where innovation is absolutely in the water, whether it's C.S. Lewis writing Alice in Wonderland or Edmund Haley discovering Haley's Comet. It all happened at Oxford. Who knows what can happen to you at Oxford at Moonshots and Moneymakers. Thank you all and have a really great day. Really appreciate your joining us for this information session today. My name is Louis Schiff, signing off. <laughs>